Hello everyone, welcome to this video on past paper analysis of AS A level accounting. So in this video, we are going to analyze the Feb March 2022 papers, paper number 12, 22 and 32. Before beginning with this video, you should be solving these papers on your own and then coming back to this video to see how I analyze the question, learn from your mistakes and make sure you try to improve on your performance in the next paper. To learn about the concepts of AS A level accounting, you can refer to the playlist uh, a AS A level financial accounting and AS A level managerial accounting or management accounting. And if you want to study further, if you are interested in studying concepts in detail, you can consider purchasing the online course also. Let's begin with paper number 12, question number one, which actions are taken in respect of the totals of a three column cash book at the end of an accounting period? So when a cash book is prepared at the end of the period with the cash and bank columns, what we do is we try to balance the columns, we try to carry forward the balance to the next period. But for discount columns, what we do is we take the totals. We don't balance it because the two columns, discount allowed columns and the discount received columns are two different columns. You can't balance them. And the totals are then transferred to the respective ledger accounts. So the correct option is option B, which states that cash and bank columns are balanced and discount columns are total. Which item is an example of capital expenditure, cost of repairs to an office building? It is a revenue expenditure. Any kind of repairs to an existing non-current asset is always a revenue expenditure. Cost of repainting business name on the delivery van. So existing non-current asset, you are repainting the business name. So again, a revenue expenditure. Legal cost paid to purchase an office building. So when you buy a non-current asset and any other incidental cost that you pay, to ensure that the purchase of the non-current asset has to be completed. All, the, all such costs are also capital expenditures. So yes, option C is correct. And D, it says legal cost to collect outstanding receivables. Here, no non-current asset is being received. So it's not a capital expenditure. On 1st July 2021, Tim bought a delivery van for $10,000. He paid an additional $900 to have racks fitted inside. So this $900 becomes a capital expenditure and it will be a part of the delivery van. Then he paid $800 for a year's insurance. Now this is not a part of the delivery van cost because this is not a capital expenditure. Insurance is an annual expense that you pay every year. So this is a revenue expenditure. Tim provides for depreciation at the rate of 10% per annum, full year's depreciation is charged in the year of acquisition. So what is the total expense recorded in Tim's income statement in respect of the van for the year ended 30th September 2021. Now. The cost of the delivery van will be total of 10,900. So 10,900 on this, he would be giving 10% depreciation since full depreciation is charged in the year of acquisition. So we will not be doing any month calculation. So the depreciation for delivery van works out to $1,090. Now for the insurance, $800 that is paid from 1st July 2021 to next year 30th of June 2022. But the year ends on 30th of September. So if you count in this financial period ending 30th September 2021, how many months have are falling? July, August and September, basically three months. So $800, which is paid for full 12 months, only three months out of these will be considered as an expense in the current year, which is $200. So total expense for the delivery van will be 1090 plus 200 dollars one two nine zero which is option number a a business has a year end of 31st december it purchased a non-current asset on first jan 2020 for hundred thousand dollars the asset was depreciated using reducing balance method at the rate of 20 percent and it was sold for forty thousand on first jan 2022 what was the loss on disposal so the cost was hundred thousand then since it was purchased on 1st Jan 2020 and sold in 2020, basically it is used for two years. So you'll have to calculate depreciation for two years. First year's depreciation would be 20%, which is 20,000. And second year's depreciation would be 20% of the net book value because reducing balance method. So 80,000 into 20%, 16,000. So total depreciation 36,000 when subtracted from the cost, the net book value is 64,000 and it is sold for sale value is 40,000. So the loss works out to 24,000. 
so option number b what is entered in the sales ledger control account cash sales is not entered because it is not a transaction with the debtors it is not a transaction that is recorded in the sales ledger increase in provision for doubtful debts again provision for doubtful debts is not a transaction that you record in the debtors account or in the sales ledger return inwards yes you record it in the sales ledger so the correct option is 5d question number 6 a trial balance included a suspense account the bank balance of 28412 had mistakenly been entered as an overdraft and placed on the credit side of the trial balance as 28142 there has also been an addition addition error and the debit side of the trial balance has been undercast or understated by 450 dollars watch which entry will correct which entry in the suspense account will correct these errors so the 28412 which is the correct bank balance this has to be debited the 28142 which was the incorrect overdraft balance that was originally credited in the trial balance will now have to be debited to rectify it so 28412 debit 28142 also we'll have to debit and the debit side undercasted by 450 that will also be have to be debited so that we can give the correct effect of it when all of these will be debited the suspense account in the entry will be credited by the total of the amount which is 57004 so the correct option is suspense credit 57004 option number 6c which statement is correct the balance on the irrecoverable debts account is carried down to the next accounting period incorrect statement it is transferred to the income statement at the end of the year the balance on the irrecoverable debts account is treated as an expense in the income statement which is the right statement the balance on the provision for doubtful debts is calculated before the deduction of irrecoverable debts incorrect because first you have to deduct the irrecoverable debts from the debtors and then on the net debtors calculate doubtful debts the balance on the provision for doubtful debts is not included in the trial balance incorrect statement because it is a, it has a credit balance it is included in the trial balance so 7b following information is available for a business general expenses in arrears and advances given opening in arrears and advances given closing total payment is given 11500 so calculate the amount to be charged in the income statement so you start with 11500 which is the amount paid to this you will add the closing arrears which is 720 and add the opening prepaid general expenses which is 240 and then you will subtract the closing prepaid which is 120 and opening accruals which is 420 so you will get 11920 option number d another way of also doing it is to prepare the general expense account the opening accrual 420 will appear balance brought down on the credit side and advance general expenses at the opening will appear as a balance brought down on the debit side payments will appear on the debit side 11500 then closing arrears general expenses balance carried down will appear on the debit side and advance general expenses at the end balance carried down will appear on the credit side so whatever you get here will be the income statement value you could use this approach also when would the year and the okay when would the year end value of inventory need to be adjusted when inventory has not been paid for incorrect inventory not being paid for means there is no sales but if there is no sales you don't have to adjust inventory you have to record the closing inventory as it is in the income statement when the selling price has fallen below the cost yes in this case the nrv will then be lower than the cost and inventory will have to be valued at nrv so necessary adjustment has to be made when the owner has recorded taking goods for his own use stock drawings has be already been recorded so you don't need to do any adjustments if stock drawings is not recorded then you have to do the adjustment so the correct option is option c two only question number 10 a business had a draft profit for the year of 250000 errors discovered depreciation charge 25000 the figure should have been 40000 closing inventory for the period was undervalued by 
So correct profit, very simple question. The depreciation was actually 40, but charged only 25. So this difference 15,000 will have to be subtracted from the draft profit and the closing inventory, which is undervalued. If you correctly value it, that will increase the profit by 10,000. Why? Because when you increase the value of the closing inventory, the value of cost of sales will fall and the value of gross profit will rise. So eventually profit will increase. So we are adding it. So the correct option is 10 B 11, a capital account for a sole trader contained three entries in addition to the opening and closing balances. What did these entries represent? So if you look at the capital account, you have balance brought down on the credit side and you have balance carried down usually on the debit side. This is assuming that it's a credit balance in the capital account. Then on the credit side, you would have any additional capital, any profit earned on the debit side, you would have drawings, you would have any loss for the year. So let's see which option, you know, matches with our capital account. The debit side, it says capital introduced. It's that's the incorrect option because capital introduced will be on the credit side. Then option B, it says debit side capital introduced again, incorrect. Option C, it says debit side drawings and loss, which is correct. And credit side, it says capital introduced, which is correct. So 11 C is the correct option. And if you read D profit for the year on the debit side is incorrect because loss is on the debit side and profit is always on the credit side. So 11 C the year end of a business is 31st December, 2021 on 5th Jan, 2022 inventory was counted and valued at 30,000. The following was then discovered. So three transactions are given. And which value of inventory should be included in financial statements at 31st December 2021. See year ends on 31st December, but they valued inventory after five days on 5th Jan. So if this is 31st December and they are giving you value on 5th of Jan, they are telling you to calculate all the reverse, all the transactions that have happened between these dates and calculate the value of inventory on 31st December. So let's say if inventory on 31st December is hundred and you buy additional goods and keep it in your inventory. So that becomes plus 20. So inventory on 5th Jan would become 120. Now, if I give you that inventory on 5th Jan is 120 goods purchased were 20. What would be the value of inventory on 31st December? You would simply do 120 minus 20 hundred. Basically you have to remove the effect of those transactions that have happened in these days. So now let's read the adjustments goods purchased and received after the year end costing 1500 had been included in valuation. So as I told you, this is already included in the valuation on 5th Jan. We want to remove the effect of these purchases. So we are going to do minus 1500 for this adjustment. It included goods returned by a customer after the year end. They had a selling price of 900, which included a markup of 25%. First of all, if selling price is 900 and markup is 25%. So we'll have to calculate the cost 900 divided by 125 into 100, which is 720. Now, since customers have returned these goods in this period and the goods are already included in the valuation, what would be the inventory without considering this transaction? We will have to subtract this 720 also because it is currently it is added. It is included. We have to exclude it. Some goods included in the inventory costing 500 were damaged. They can be sold for 300 after repair cost of 100. So NRV becomes 200 cost is 500. It means Currently the inventory is overvalued by 300, the difference cost 500 and NRV 200. So there is a extra valuation or overvaluation of $300. We will have to subtract. So minus 300. So 30,000 minus 1500 minus 720 and minus 300. So option number A, 27,480. A sole trader provided the following information for the year ended 31st December. Non-current assets increased by 25,000. Current assets increased by 10,000. Current liabilities increased by 12,500. Additional capital and drawings. Fine. So calculate the profit. So what's the formula for profit? Closing capital minus opening capital 
plus drawings minus any additional capital. Now closing capital minus opening capital, they've not given you the values of closing and opening capital, but they've given you how much is the increase in capital because increase in capital will be equal to the increase in assets minus the increase in liability. So 25 plus 10, that's the total increase in assets and 12,500, that's the increase in liability. So the difference will be the increase in capital. So 35,000 minus 12,500, 22,500. To this, we will add 13,000 minus 20,000. So 13C, 15,500. Which rule does not apply in the absence of a partnership agreement? Interest on partner's loan is charged at 6%. This is the incorrect number, incorrect rate. Correct rate is 5%. So this rule does not apply. And hence, option, uh, option A is correct for question number 14. If we read the other options also, no interest on capital is charged, correct. No salaries is, are paid, correct. Profits and losses are shared equally, correct. So all these three points apply if there is no agreement. P and Q are in partnership sharing profits and losses equally on 1st Jan 2021 partnership had net assets of 410,000 at that date R was admitted they decide to revalue the assets to 480,000 so the revaluation profit is 480 minus 410 70,000 and goodwill will be valued at 50,000 new profit sharing ratio is given what was the change in Q's capital let's quickly do a format of Q's capital account. On the credit side, we will have the revaluation profit. 70,000 profit over profit sharing ratio mean is, is equally. So 1 by 2 of 70,000, 35,000 on the credit side. Then goodwill will be first be created or credited in Q's capital in the old ratio, which is 1 by 2 again. 1 by 2 of 50,000, 25,000. Then the same goodwill value, which is 50,000 will be written off in all the partners capital account in their new ratio. So Q's ratio is 40%, 40% of 50,000 is 20,000 on the debit side. So if you count credit side 60 minus 20, so Q's capital increases by 40,000, so 15 D. 16, question number 16, X and Y are in partnership sharing Residual profits and losses equally. Partners are charged 2% interest on drawings. Y is charged, is entitled to a, sa a salary of 10,000. Drawings are given for both the partners. Profit is given 52,000. Calculate each partner share of residual profits. Fine. So profit is 52,000. To this, we will add interest on drawings. Total in drawings is 30,000. Interest is 2%. So 600. So 52,000 plus 600 minus salary of 10,000. So 40 to 600, this will be shared equally. So divided by two, 21, 300, but the option is not there. Some calculation mistake. Okay, the drawings total is not 30,000, it is 20,000. 20,000 into 2% is 400. So 400, so 42, 400, 21, 200. So option D. Which statements are correct? Dividends can be paid out of general reserve, correct? General reserve is a revenue reserve. It can be paid or it can be used to pay dividend. Rights issue can be made from share premium account. It's an incorrect statement. If this statement was replaced with bonus shares, I would correct this statement as correct one because in rights issue, you are not using any kind of reserve to issue shares, you're getting money. So this statement is not correct. General reserve can be created from retained earnings. That's a correct statement. So one and three, 17 B. Limited company had the following balances, revaluation reserve, retained earnings, profit was 105,000. The revaluation is of 20,000 was created two years ago from a revaluation of a property. Same property was again revalued on 31st December 2021 with a loss of 35,000. Interim dividend 40,000. Final dividend proposed 55,000. What is the value of retained earnings on 31st December 2021? Firstly, the loss that you see here, revaluation loss, this 35,000 loss, first of all, the revaluation profit 
20,000, the balance and revaluation reserve will be used to set off this loss. So the remaining loss of 15,000 will then be deducted from the profit or from the retained earnings. So our retained earnings balance is 142,000 opening balance. To this, you will add the profit given 105,000. You will subtract the 15,000 revaluation reserve or revaluation loss. You will subtract 40,000 interim dividend. The dividend proposed 55,000. You will not record. It is never recorded. Only dividend paid is recorded. So 192,000 18D. The bank balance of a limited company was 390,000 before following transactions took place. Issue of shares 500,000 of 0 0.5, which means that's a face value or power value. And it was made at a premium of 0.25. So total price received per share was 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25, 0 0.75. And total money received would be 0 0.75 into 500,000. Debentures for 100,000 were repaid. Bonus issue of 100,000 shares were made. What is the bank balance after these transactions? Bank for bank balance, bonus issue will not affect the bank balance. 100,000 will be subtracted and the issue of new shares will be added. So 500,000 into 0.75 is 375,000. This will be added. 100,000 will be subtracted. So 390,000. Six hundred sixty five thousand nineteen B. What what might cause a decrease in company's non-current asset turnover? So non-current asset turnover, if you if you remember the formula, it is revenue divided by non-current assets. To decrease the company, com, the to decrease the company's non-current asset turnover, either the revenue should decrease or the value of non-current assets should increase. Then the formula will eventually decrease in number. So increase in expenses has no connection. Increase in sales revenue. If sales revenue increases, the non-current asset turnover will increase. So this is not the correct option. Purchase of new non-current assets. Yes, that will lead to a decrease in non-current asset turnover. Selling non-current assets. No, it will have an opposite effect. It will, in fact, increase the non-current asset turnover. So 20C. 20 C. The following information for a limited company at 31st December 2021 is available. Ordinary share capital, retained earnings, 8% debentures. Retained earnings at 1st Jan 2021 were 82,000. Okay, these values are given on 31st December, which is the closing and this is opening retained earnings. Interim dividend of 45,000 was paid. What was the return on capital employed? Okay, for return on capital employed, you need numerator profit from operations, operating profit and denominator you need capital employed. Now capital employed is available because if you take the total of ordinary share capital, retained earnings and 8% debentures, you will get the capital employed, which is 510,000. Profit from operations is not given directly, but they've given you the retained earnings opening and closing balances. So what we can say is that the profit from operations, okay, let's say net profit for the year would be the difference between the Closing retained earnings 110,000 and opening retained earnings 82,000. But there was also interim dividend 45,000, which would have been adjusted in the retained earnings column of the statement of changes to equity. So that will also be added here to calculate how much was the profit that was added in the retained earnings column. So 73,000. Now this is the net profit for numerator of the ROC formula. We need profit from operations. So to this, we will have to add back the finance cost, which is 8% of 100,000, the interest on debentures. So plus 8,000. So we get 81,000. Now in the formula, what I'll do is 81,000 divided by 510,000, 15.88% 21D. Which statements about stepped cost are correct? Fixed co fixed within a range of activity levels. Yes, yes, that's correct. Within certain activity levels, it is fixed. The moment activity level increases or it decreases, fixed, the stepped up costs tend to increase or decrease accordingly. Fixed, whatever the level of activity, no, because then the, it wouldn't be stepped up cost. It would be fixed cost. Then includes fixed cost only. Yes, only fixed costs are part of stepped cost. 
variable costs are never a part of fixed cost or sorry stepped cost because then the if variable costs are included in stepped cost stepped cost wouldn't behave in that manner okay includes both fixed and variable cost not the correct statement so 1 and 3 option a 22a a production worker is paid $15 per hour for 8 hours a day overtime is paid at the rate of time and a fifth okay basically normal rate plus 1/5 which is plus 20% Productivity bonus is also paid at the rate of twenty-one dollars per unit for each unit produced in excess of twelve units a day. So first of all, if a if the worker works more than eight hours a day, overtime will be paid at the rate of one point two times the original wage rate. And if he produces more than twelve units a day, he'll be paid bonus also. So wages of the worker would include his basic pay, overtime pay, and bonus. Okay, last Friday production worker worked twelve hours and assembled fourteen units. How much did he earn? Basic will be eight hours into fifteen dollars, one twenty dollars. How much overtime did he work? He worked four hours extra. Eight hours is normal day. He worked twelve hours, so four into hundred and twenty percent of fifteen dollars. So fifteen dollars plus twenty percent, three dollars, eighteen dollars. He would be getting four into eighteen dollars as overtime, and for bonus. He produced more than twelve units. He produced two extra units, so twenty-one into two, forty-two dollars. So one twenty plus seventy-two plus forty-two, twenty-three D. A retailer made the following purchases of inventory: fifth, twelfth, and third, twenty-third October. Quantity unit prices are given. There was no opening inventory. FIFO is used, so when FIFO is used, your closing inventory is always from the latest batch. So closing inventory, and your issues or cost of sales is always from the first set of inventories. What was the gross profit? Okay, in October twenty twenty, in sorry, in October two hundred units were sold for nine hundred dollars. So this is the sales. What was the gross profit? So gross profit will be sales minus. Uh, cost of sales. Sales is given as two hundred into nine hundred dollars, hundred and eighty thousand. And cost of sales will be the cost that was incurred to purchase these two hundred units. Now, for cost, you will have to take the first set of purchases, the initial purchases, initial two hundred purchases. Now, first fifty units are purchased, then. Another fifty units are purchased, so that makes it hundred units. So for the first hundred units, the cost was twenty five thousand plus twenty five thousand fifty thousand. Now for the next hundred units purchased on twenty third October, if we take hundred units into a rate of five twenty five, so fifty two thousand five hundred. So total cost for two hundred units would be hundred and two thousand five hundred. So one eighty thousand minus hundred and two five hundred. So seventy-seven thousand five hundred twenty-four C. If they had asked you the value of closing inventory, you would do fifty uh, units left from the twenty-third October batch because two fifty were purchased, two hundred sold. So fifty units left into cost of that batch or cost per unit in that batch was five twenty-five. So fifty into five twenty-five. This will be the value of closing inventory. But here they have not asked you to do that, so it's okay. Company has two departments in its factory. Details are shown below. Manufacturing assembly total. Okay, what is the fixed overhead absorption rate per hour in the machining department? In the machining department, the budgeted overheads are one eighty thousand, and budgeted hours are six thousand. So divide it thirty dollars. Straightforward. Twenty six. What would cause overheads to be over absorbed? Over absorption of overheads will happen. If the absorbed overheads are greater than actual overheads, or actual working hours or actual output, let's say actual activity is greater than budgeted activity. So let's now read the options. Overheads absorbed is greater than overhead budgeted. No, overheads absorbed have to be compared to actual overheads. Overheads absorbed is less than overhead budgeted. No, overheads incurred. Okay, incurred means actual. 
because what is actually actual overheads that is incurred in the business overheads incurred is greater than the absorbed overheads no because in that case it would be under absorbed overheads incurred is less than the absorbed overheads yes that's the correct option so 26 d company has the following information for producing 2000 units of a product so sales direct material direct labor expenses other variable overheads and fixed overheads what's the contribution to sales ratio so for that you need to calculate the contribution divided by sales and multiplied by 100 sales is 85,000 how would you calculate the contribution sales minus all the variable cost so 85,000 minus 56,700 which is the total of variable cost and then multiplied by 100 so 27 B the following information is available about two products material X material Y okay product one and product two for each of these products these raw materials are needed and then direct labor these many hours are needed production is planned to be 100 units of each product okay 700 kilos of raw material X is available 400 kilos of material Y is available total of 800 direct labor hours can be worked what are the limiting factors okay what is the total requirement of material X for product one 100 units into 2, 200, plus 100 units into 4 kilos, 400, 600 would be needed totally for material X. Availability is 700, so th this is not the limiting factor. For material Y, 100 units into 3 kilos, 300, plus 100 units into 1 kilo, 100, totally 400 would be required. Availability is 400, so this is again not a limiting factor. Direct labor. 100 units into 3 hours, 300 hours total, 100 units into 6 hours, 600 hours, 900, availability is 800, so yes, direct labor is a limiting factor, so the correct option is 28A. A company provides the following information about its product, selling price, variable cost, fixed cost and break even, okay, if the business changes its production method, contribution will increase by 10% and fixed cost will increase by 5%. So if we calculate the revised break even point, we will get revised fixed cost upon revised contribution per unit. Revised fixed cost would be adding 10%, sorry, 5% extra to 21,600, 22,680 and divided by contribution per unit. Current contribution per unit is 60. We'll have to increase it by $66 per unit. So, 344 units is the new break even. Existing break even is 360. So, it is decreasing by 16 units. So, 29A. What are the possible limitations of a budgetary control system? Budgets are based on estimates. Yes, that's the correct statement. You try to forecast the future performance. So, it has to be based on estimates. Budgets may lead to staff demotivation. Yes, it may lead to staff demotivation, especially if the budgets are unrealistic, goals are unrealistic, then budgets may prevent managers from being creative. Yes, it may happen if the budget targets are too easy, if no effort is required on part of the employees, on part of the departmental managers to put in their creativity, then yes, it can do so. So 30 C, 1, 2 and 3 option, all three are correct. So that completes paper number 12. Let's start with paper number 22 now. Question number one, Rafiq owns a retail business. When the business has opened a few years ago, Rafiq maintained only minimal accounting records. State two reasons why the owner of a business might maintain minimal accounting records. So why would a business not maintain double entry bookkeeping? Uh, probably cost saving. So you can write about cost savings. You could say that no knowledge of double entry bookkeeping. That would be one reason why owner or the businessman would not keep proper accounting records. Or you can also say that the transactions are very minimum in the business. So there is no need to keep detailed accounting records. Or you can say time saving the businessman does not want to spend a lot of time doing the accounting uh, process so he keeps only minimal accounting records so any two 
points and you can explain. Identify four benefits of maintaining full accounting records. So when you keep full accounting records, you are able to prepare a trial balance that helps to check the accuracy of your accounting records. If you don't have full records, you can't check the accuracy of whatever records you've maintained. That is not possible. Then you can prepare your income statement and calculate the profit or loss made during the period conveniently. Then you can prepare your statement of financial position or balance sheet to understand or to list down the proper balances of all your assets, liabilities and capital on any date. Then you could also use in important information for decision making. Let's say you want to understand how much sales happened a certain between two dates, how much purchases were made or what are the cash records, what are the banking transactions that have happened or certain transactions with a group of customers, with a group of suppliers, all of these information can be extracted from the account accounting records and uh, it can be used for proper decision making. Additional information, more recently Rafiq has been able to provide more detailed financial information. On 1st Jan 2021, the business's assets and liabilities were as follows. Cash is there, bank overdraft is there, furniture and fittings is there, trade payables, inventory and rent prepaid. Okay, let's go ahead. Then the following summary of receipts and payments has been extracted from the for the year ended 31st December 2021. So the assets and liabilities balances that were given earlier, those were opening balances. These are receipts and payments, cash, sales, bank, disposal of furniture and fittings. And then we have drawings, payment to trade payables, rent, purchase of furniture and fittings, general expenses. Okay. All purchases were on credit basis, all sales were on cash basis. Cash discount of 5% was received from the trade payables. And the closing balance of trade payables at 31st December was 9230. So calculate the total purchases for the year ended 31st December 2021. You could either do it as a formula or you could prepare the trade payables account or in other words, the purchase ledger control account. You could have the opening balance. Then you can have your payments, which will come from the payment section 93100. Then you will record your discount received because adjustment number five, if you see there was a 5% cash discount. How would you calculate your discount received? See the payment to trade payables 93,100. If 5% discount is received, this will be the 95% of the overall amount. So divide by 95 multiplied by five, you will get your discount value. So 4,900 that becomes your discount received payments would be 93,100 closing balance is given balance carry down 9,230 and then on the credit side you will have purchases as the balancing figure so you can calculate the total of debits minus the credits. Next page during the year ended 31st December 2021 some cash takings were not banked but were used to pay wages 21,540 and Drawings was taken 2580. Goods costing 480 was taken for personal use, so stock drawings. Furniture and fittings were with a value of 2950 were sold. So if you see the receipt side, disposal of furniture and fittings 3480. The value or the book value of these fittings were 2950. So profit on disposal 3480 minus 2950. Five hundred thirty is the profit on disposal, and then at thirty first December, cash takings of twelve hundred not yet banked, pending to be banked. Balance of cash in hand nine twenty, which is over and above this twelve hundred. Inventory closing is eleven nine twenty. Furniture and fitting closing balance is twenty three four hundred. Rent is fourteen forty. Prepare the income statement. So okay, how would you prepare the income statement? Sales. First of all, you'll have to calculate the sales. So in the you can use this working box to make all your calculations. How would you calculate the sales? The takings banked, which is 132, 200, 
plus before banking or before depositing the takings we paid from that the wages 21540 we took 2580 as cash drawings 1200 takings are not yet banked so that will also be added plus the closing balance of cash which is 920 and minus the opening balance of cash which if we go to the previous page 840 so that gives you your total sales if you don't understand this by formula you could also prepare the cash account balance brought down then takings bank you will have wages you will have drawings balance carry down you can take the total of 1200 pending takings and 920 and then balancing figure on the debit side will be sales either you do it using a cash account or you use it a, use it, use a formula to calculate so that you can continue with your income statement apart from that purchases we've already calculated opening inventory given in the previous page closing inventory is given here 11 920 and stock drawings also will be used for calculation of gross profit so once you get a gross profit then coming to the income section do we have any other income yes there was a discount received of 4900 that will be other income and there was a profit on disposal 530 so that will be other income and coming to expenses expenses are almost straightforward like general expenses directly you can take 5940 rent 14750 but there is an adjustment of prepaid rent 14750 if you see the opening balance there was rent prepaid 1250 so this will be added and closing rent prepaid 1440 this will be subtracted so you will get the rent accrued for this year that will be taken in the income statement and apart from that we have depreciation on furniture and fittings which will be the opening balance of furniture and fittings if you take from the previous page 20 to 710 to this we will add the total cost of furniture and fittings purchased 8000 and installation cost also 380 so 8380 out of this the book value of the fittings sold 2950 we will subtract and the closing valuation 23400 we will subtract so whatever difference you get that you can take as depreciation on furniture and fittings if you don't under understand this you can also understand it using a furniture and fittings account L like we did in IGCSE for revaluation method you can have balance brought down you can have purchases of furniture and fittings you can have disposals at book value and balance carry down and the difference will be depreciation apart from that expenses also wages will be there 21,540 and you that's it so wages depreciation rent and general expenses so four expenses and then you will get your net profit additional information Rafiq would like to expand his business but requires additional finance to carry out his plan he is considering two options invite a friend Khalid to become a partner in the business Khalid would induce capital of 10,000 and option to apply for a bank loan of 10,000 so which advise him which option he should choose justify by discussing both financial and non-financial issues of each option so if you talk about option one which is you have to admit uh, admit Khalid as a permanent partner one advantage would be that it is a permanent source of capital whereas in a bank loan the money will have to be repaid that is one advantage then one disadvantage would be that profits will have to be shared so share of profits so this become this if you think about it this is the non-financial aspect and this is the financial aspect profits will have to be shared so that is a disadvantage but at the same time one advantage can also be that the responsibility and the risk of the business can also be shared if you discuss the option number two the uh, the taking of bank loan of 10,000 one advantage would be that day-to-day -day decision making will not be affected because if we have a new partner decision making will be slow 
that will be an advantage but disadvantage would be that interest and principal repayments have to be done on time as per schedule so that can be a risk for the business that can be a risk to the liquidity of the business and then since there are there's only sole trader here so no chance of any disagreement or you can also shift this point to the first option and discuss it there that there may be higher chances of disagreements between the partner and at the end give a justification or get a, give an advice any advice would be okay just back it with a with a concluding statement question number 2 t limited's financial statement statement of financial position at 28 feb 2021 included the following equity issued capital share premium and retained earnings on 31st august 2021 directors paid an interim dividend of dollar 0.05 per share calculate the amount of interim dividend paid so interim dividend calculation would be number of shares multiplied by dividend per share 450,000 is the share capital and 0.5 dollars is the value of one share so the number of shares would be 450,000 divided by 0.5 and this will be multiplied by dollar 0.05 dividend per share so 45,000 identify two factors which director should take into account when deciding the amount of dividend payment to shareholders firstly they will have to decide or they will have to take into account the balance in their revenue reserves because if they don't have sufficient reserves sufficient balance in the general reserve in the retained earnings they will not be able to pay the dividend then they will also have to check their balances in cash and cash equivalents or cash and bank if they don't have sufficient money to pay the uh, dividend they will not be able to pay the dividend anyway another point that you can write is they could also consider the future growth plans before paying dividend because if you plan to grow in future if you want to expand in future you would need that money for expansion so you'll have to pay less dividends or one could also say you will have to take into account the shareholder expectations also so any of the two points are okay on 1st december 2021 the directors made a bonus issue on the basis of two ordinary shares for every three held directors wish to leave the reserves in the most flexible form Currently, the share capital is 450,000. So, divide by 3 into 2. So, they want to issue 300,000 as the value of new bonus shares. So, this will be taken first from the share premium balance, 122,000. Because reserves have to be kept in the most flexible form. And balance, 178,000 will be taken from the retained earnings. So, the journal entry would be debit the share premium 122,000 debit the retained earnings 178,000 and credit the ordinary share capital 300,000 narrative is not required so this much is okay additional information on 28th feb 2022 directors paid a final dividend of 0.07 dollars per share on all the shares issued at this date so this will include the opening shares and the bonus shares also the company's profit for the year ended 28th feb 2022 was 114000 dollars calculate the closing balance of retained earnings account at the at 28th feb 2022 so you will be taking up the opening balance of retained earnings to this you will add the profit for the year you will subtract the interim dividend you will subtract the final dividend and you will subtract the part of the bonus issue that was done from the retained earnings so opening balance is yeah 342,000 profit 114,000 interim dividend 45,000 final dividend we will have to calculate so working note final dividend total number of shares would be initially 900,000 shares 450,000 divided by 0 0.5 and then additionally 
600,000 shares were issued. So total 1.5 million shares were at issue. Or if you want, you can show the calculation. 750,000 worth of capital divided by dollar zero point five per share is the face value. This will give you the number of shares multiplied by dollars zero point zero seven. So hundred and five thousand. So this we will take here final dividend and bonus issue from the journal entries. If you see hundred and seventy eight was used. So this gives us closing balance of retained earnings as hundred and twenty eight thousand. Part E. State three reasons why a company sometimes makes a rights issue of shares rather than a general issue of shares. So the advantage of having a rights issue instead of a general issue or a new issue of shares is that first of all, there is no dilution of ownership. If you give shares to new shareholders, new owners, the ownership of existing shareholders will get diluted. There'll be more number of owners now in the business and later on the profits will have to be distributed or divided between more number of shareholders. So that's one advantage. Second, the issue of right shares that involves less legal formalities compared to a public issue. And hence it is less expensive also. So costs involved are less. So this is good for the company. And the third advantage that you can write is that there are higher chances of the issue being subscribed. Why? Because the existing shareholders are already aware of the business of the company. They have confidence in the company. So they will, they might be interested in their high chances that they might be interested in buying the shares of the same company. But if you go on for a normal public issue, the new shareholders before putting their money, they might want to study the company. They might want to study the management, the history of the company. What does the company plan to do with this money? And if they are comfortable, if they have confidence in the company, then only shareholders would be interested in buying the shares of this company or subscribing to the shares. So in rights issue, there is always a higher confidence, higher chance that shares would get subscribed. Question number three, Bipin, Feroz and Niru have been in partnership for many years, sharing profits and losses in the ratio three is to one is to two. Feroz decided to retire from the partnership with effect from 1st Jan 2020. On that date, balance sheet is given. Non-current assets are there, current assets are there, capital current accounts are there and then current liabilities there. Okay. The following information is also available. Non-current assets were revalued at 155,000 and inventory was revalued at 13,160. Goodwill was valued at 39,000. Bipin and Niru would continue to share profits and losses equally. So one is to one. And on his retirement, Feroz agreed to take non-current assets at its valuation of 15,000 and remaining to be uh, due to him as a loan to the partnership. On the next page, prepare partner's capital account. Before preparing the partner's capital account, what we can do is we can quickly do a working note to calculate the revaluation profit or loss. You could either make a T account or you could do it in a form of a statement. So the non-current assets, book value is 132,000, revalued amount is 155,000. So there is a profit on revaluation. So that I'm going to put on the credit side of revaluation account as non-current assets, the difference 23,000. And for inventory, if you see, it's a loss on revaluation because the revalued amount is lower than the existing book value. So 17,560 minus 13, 460 so 4400 so hence there is a revaluation profit net profit on revaluation which is 18600 now this will be shared by the partners bipin feroz and niru in the ratio 3 is to 1 is to 2 so bipin gets 3 by 6 which is 9300 Feroz gets 1 by 6, which is 3,100 and Niru gets 2 by 6, which is 6,200. Once we have this, now we can prepare the capital account. So starting with the capital account, we will begin with balance brought down, which 
is 72,000, And Firoz is retiring, so we will put Firoz's current account in the capital account now. There is a debit balance of 1980, it's a negative number, so on the debit side, Firoz's current account, 1980. There was a revaluation profit that appears on the credit side of the partner's capital account. 9300, 3100 and 6200. Goodwill was 39,000. So what you do first you create goodwill in the old ratio on the credit side of partner's capital in the ratio 3 is to 1 is to 2. So 39,000 when divided 19,500, 6,500 and 13,000. And then you will have to write off goodwill on the debit side in the continuing partner's account in their new ratio which is 1 is to 1. So 19,500 and 19,500. Then it says that Firoz agreed to take non-current assets at its valuation. So on the debit side, non-current assets 15,000 in Firoz's column. And then whatever is the balance in Firoz's account that will go in Firoz's loan account. So the credit side total is 53,900 and if you subtract the debit entries so the balance in Firoz's loan would amount to Okay, this goodwill 19,500 should have been in Niru column. That was a mistake. So 53,900 minus 1,980 minus 15,000, 36,920. And for the remaining two partners, you can calculate the balance carried down. You can take the totals and then see how much is the balance carried down that you get. When you do the calculations, I'll just write the numbers here. 81,300 and 56,700. Continuing with the question, additional information, Bipin and Neeru have agreed the following for the new partnership. They will no longer use current accounts. So each partner's current account will be transferred to the partner's capital account and the opening balances of the capital account are to reflect their new profit sharing ratio. If you remember the new profit sharing ratio was one is to one. So what this statement means is they want to start the new partnership with Capital accounts being in the proportion of 1 is to 1 which means they want the capital accounts to be equal for both the partners. So Niru was to introduce a withdraw funds in order to achieve this. So whatever is the capital account balance of Bipin, Niru is going to make the adjustment and make her capital account equal to Bipin's capital account. So calculate the amount Niru should introduce or withdraw. So let's calculate Bipin's new capital. in the firm okay it's already there 81300 we got balance carried down but the current accounts have now to be transferred to the capital account so Bipin's current account is 4240 so his revised capital account balance will be dollars 81300 plus $4240 $85,540 and Niru's capital before adjustment her balance carry down as per capital account was 56,700 and if you see her current account in the balance sheet it is showing minus 2750 so debit balance so minus 2750 before adjustment currently Niru's capital stands at 53,950 now to make her capital equal to Bipin's capital obviously Niru will have to bring in more capital in the firm so capital introduced by Niru will be the difference 85,540 minus 53,950 so dollars 31,590 Explain one reason for valuing goodwill when a partner retires. So when a partner is retiring, you are valuing goodwill and giving the credit to the partner's capital so as to compensate the partner for the
profit share sacrificed in favor of the continuing partners and apart from this you could also mention points like the partner was also responsible for the favorable reputation of the business that leads to valuation of goodwill and hence the partner should be given due credit in his capital account so these are the reasons state two reasons why it is usual not to maintain goodwill account in the books of a partnership firm see the first important reason is that this is a self generated goodwill the goodwill that you value at the time of admission or at the time of retirement it's self generated no money has been paid for it so we cannot show it as an asset in the balance sheet because then it would be against the prudence and the second reason you could say is that goodwill valuation is very subjective so if you ask different people to value goodwill they might value it differently and even they might arrive at different values which would be quite different from each other so valuation is subjective and in such cases you can't allow goodwill account to appear in the books and to be shown in the balance sheet as an asset so these are the reasons question number 4 are limited uses absorption costing at one of its factories the fact this factory has two production departments machining and assembly and two service departments support and canteen some budgeted overheads have already been apportioned the remaining budgeted overheads are as follows depreciation is there and supervisors wages in the production departments the following additional information is given okay some details are given about the four departments floor area power machine cost and number of employees canteen provides meal for staff in the machining assembly and support departments basically whatever is the cost of canteen the departments all three departments which is machine machining assembly and support all these departments are responsible for the cost that is incurred in the canteen department so canteen cost will have to be distributed between all three departments in what ratio obviously in the ratio of number of employees because higher the number of employees in a department higher will be the apportion or the proportion of cost that you would give to that department because number of more number of employees means more number more expenses for the canteen department so canteen cost i would say will be di distributed between machining assembly and support in the ratio 75 is to 35 is to 8 which is the number of employees and then it says support departments overhead should be reapportioned on the basis of production departments machine cost only so the support department their cost will not be given to canteen only to machining assembly and that too in the ratio of machinery cost which is 850 is to 110 or you can say 85 is to 11. So complete part A, complete the following table to show apportionment of overheads and reapportionment of service department overheads. Currently some overheads are already given in these four departments. We have to first apportion the depreciation and production department supervisors wages first we'll do that depreciation will obviously go in the ratio of machinery cost because depreciation calculations are based on the cost so higher the cost for any department higher will be the depreciation so 25,000 depreciation when you divide in the ratio 850 is to 110 is to 15 is to 25 850 is to 110 is to 15 is to 25 so we get 21,250, 2750, 375 and 625 and then production department's supervisor wages now understand that they are clearly telling you that these expenses are for production departments only so these expenses 19,800 will not be distributed between service departments only the production departments and the distribution will be in the ratio of number of employees why because the job of a supervisor is to supervise the employees so higher the number of employees in any department higher will be the cost of supervision so production department supervisor wages that will be divided between production departments machining and assembly in the ratio 75 is to 35 so 13,500 and 6,300 taking the total of all the department cost first 141,100 37,650, 7,555 and 14,495. Now they are telling you reapportion canteen. So obviously we will reapportion canteen. In case they don't give you 
that do canteen or do support first what will you do first you will still do the canteen department why because canteen is providing service to all other three departments whereas support department is giving services to only the production departments so the department that is giving services to more number of departments you will do that first and then you will do the service department that is giving service to less number of departments so canteen we will have to divide 14495 as discussed in the ratio of number of employees 75 is to 35 is to 8 so when we do that 9 to 1 3 4 to double 9 9 83 next step is to take a total so 150 313 41 9 49 8538 and canteen obviously becomes 0. Next step is to divide support. So 8538 will be distributed in the ratio. 850 is to 110 or 85 is to 11. So 7560 978. So support and canteen at the end becomes 0. For machining the total comes to 157. 873 and 42,927. Then next page additional information direct labor hours per month and machine hours per month for both the departments are given. If you see for machining department the machine hours are greater than the labor hours. This means that this department is a capital intensive department. Whereas if you see the assembly department, the labor hours are higher than the machine hours, which means assembly department is a labor intensive department. Why is this information important? Because when calculating the overhead absorption rate in the next question, the formula for overhead absorption rate is budgeted overheads divided by budgeted activity hours. Now this hours it would depend or it could be either labor hours or it could be machine hours depends if the department is capital intensive or labor intensive in machining department since it's capital intensive machine hours are dominating they are higher than the labor hours so we would calculate our overhead absorption rate for machining based on machine hours while in assembly department labor hours are more dominating they are higher than the machine hours so we will calculate the overhead absorption rate for assembly department using the labor hours. So that's what I want to explain. So for the machining department, if you see the budgeted overheads in the previous part A, we got 157,873 divided by budgeted. Okay, I'll change this for machining uh, calculation. We'll write budgeted machine hours divided by 5,600 hours so the rate comes to dollars 28.19 per machine hour whereas for assembly department overhead absorption rate will be equal to budgeted overheads divided by budgeted labor hours so from part a budgeted overheads of assembly department are 42,927 divided by budgeted labor hours 2,400 so dollars 17.89 per labor hour part c state true two reasons why overheads may be under absorbed overheads may be under absorbed for two possible reasons first reason is that the actual activity or actual output is less than budgeted activity so you assumed that for example if you assume that for machining department you will absorb the overheads at the rate of 28 dollars 28.19 dollars per machine hour so the more activity you work let's say customers are placing orders and there are a lot of orders so the more orders you make higher will be the machine hours worked in the factory and higher you will absorb you will Make sure that you collect them from your customers. But if the activity level is low, if the demand for your products are low, the budgeted or oh sorry, the actual machine hours will be low. And in that case, you will absorb overheads less. So actual activity is less than the budgeted activity. Another reason is that 
you predicted certain level of budgeted overheads for the two departments and based on that only you calculated your overhead absorption rate so it is possible that the actual overheads that you pay are much higher than the budgeted overheads and that is why you ended up absorbing less overheads so the second reason would be the actual overheads are greater than budgeted overheads Additional information at another factory, a single product is made. This factory uses marginal costing. The following information is available. Direct cost, direct material cost, direct labor cost and selling price is given. Fixed cost per month is given. Production capacity of the factory is given 15,000. Factory has been operating at below its normal capacity. However, recently demand for company's product has increased. The directors believe that there's an opportunity to increase profits. They are considering two options to meet increasing demand. Increase the selling price by 5%. Currently, selling price is 27. So, 5% of this would be 1.35. So, your revised selling price will be $28.35. Increase the production to 16,000 units per month. Overtime is paid at an additional rate of $4.1 per unit. So, for 15,000 units, First 15,000 units, you will pay labor cost at dollars 10.1. But after that, for additional 1,000 units, you will be paying labor cost at the rate of 10.1 plus 4.1, $14.2 dollars per unit. And reduce monthly advertising cost by 2,000. So the fixed cost 44,000 will become 42,000 in this case. Option two, increase the production capacity per month by 15% by purchasing additional machinery costing 78,000 this machinery will be depreciated at the rate of 20% per annum. Now if you increase the production capacity by 15% so 2250 extra units can be produced so the new output in this case will be 15,000 plus 2250 17,250 and the depreciation of the machinery which is 78,000 into 20% annually so 15,600 this will be additional fixed cost every every year but I think this is all monthly data so for uh, uh, for monthly depreciation 15,600 divided by 12 1300 dollars will be extra fixed cost Selling price is $27. Supplier of the materials currently offer a trade discount of 20%. This will increase to 30%. So if you see direct material cost is $8.8. .8. Now this $8.8 .8 is after deduction of 20% discount. So how much would be the price before discount? So you'll have to divide this by 80%. And to arrive at the new material cost, you will have to remove the discount. Okay, either you do it directly into 70%. Or if that is difficult to understand what you can do is you can first calculate the cost material cost before discount which comes to $11 and from this additional 30% or uh, the new discount is 30% so $3.3 will be deducted so dollars 7.7 .7 per unit will be the revised material cost versus 8.8 .8 in the previous case so what I can do is I'll prefer to show the calculations as 8.8 .8 dollars divided by 80 percent into 70 percent 7.7 dollars per unit. The additional machinery will be more efficient and production will not require any overtime working so labor cost remains as it is. Calculate the monthly profit to be made for each option option number one and option number two. Okay let's try to calculate the profit using a marginal costing statement. So profit statement We begin with the revenues, 16,000 into 28.35, so 453,600. First, we will deduct all our variable cost, which is direct material. Now, direct material in first case, there is no change, so 16,000 into dollars 8.8 8, 
and direct labor. Now this will have two components 15,000 into 10.1 and 1000 into 14.2. So we, what we can do is we can do, show the calculations separately below. So this comes to 165,700. So the total variable cost would come to 306,500. This when deducted we will get a contribution. So 147, 100 and from this we will subtract our fixed cost, monthly fixed cost, 44,000 but 2,000 will get reduced. So our revised fixed cost was 42,000. So profit 105, 100. Now going to option 2, again similar statement we'll do. Revenues 17,250 multiplied by selling price $27. So 465, 750. From this, we will subtract our variable cost under that first direct material. There is no, okay, there's a change in direct material here 17,250 into 7.7. .7. 132,825 and direct labor there is no change in the wage rates so 17,250 into 10.1 174,225 so 307,050 so when we deduct that, we get a contribution of 158,700 less fixed cost. Now fixed cost would be 44,000 existing fixed cost plus 1,300 for the monthly depreciation. So 45,300. Make sure to show the calculations 44,000 plus depreciation dollars 78,000 divided by 12 into 20 percent. So, profit in this case is coming to 113,400. The cost of additional machinery required in option 2 would be financed by an issue of ordinary shares. Advise the directors which option they should choose. Justify your answer by considering both financial and non-financial factors. So we will list down the points for option 1 and option 2 and then at the end you can give a justification. So from profit point of view, we can say option 2 is more profitable. But in case of option 2, there is an issue of ordinary shares. Now the cost involved in issuing ordinary shares that is ignored here that is not even considered. So cost of issue of shares are ignored that will have to be considered and taken into account. And in option one we can say points like over since there is overtime involved labor dissatisfaction can be there or quality can get affected so poor quality because of labor fatigue and in case of option one the selling price is increased by five percent one also has to think higher selling price is sustainable to what extent 
is it sustainable for a long time so that will have to be seen and then what else can we do advertisement cost if you reduce by 2000 in order to increase a profit currently it may work but lower advertisement spending may lead to loss of customers in the long run so these factors can be considered for option one then for option two if we read then what else can we see suppliers of material are offering discount so we will have to see the quality of raw materials should not get affected because of higher discounts and then since additional machinery is being bought the training training cost for that is not mentioned here so training cost and loss of time during training are ignored here so that will also have to be taken into account before you you can you know you say which one is exactly more profitable so now we also have to advise which option is more suitable so what you can say is that they can choose option two subject to the fact that the higher demand is expected for a considerable number of years if it is just there for a few months let's say six months then it doesn't make time make sense to spend on the machinery spend on the training issue shares and bear that cost so if the demand is expected to be, to be there for a really long time then it may make more sense to choose option two while giving the concluding statement just give this state give this reason also question f state two benefits of budgetary control so there is a clear direction in the organization and that is also communicated to the employees so everyone is working towards the everyone is working towards the same objective that is good for the organization resources will be better utilized so better coordination and communication and limitations that departmental budgets are connected So this is a limitation because uh, let's say sales department is dependent on the production department because if production department does not complete their target production, they are not able to produce the goods, sales department will not be able to complete their target of selling. So departmental budgets are interconnected. So it can be a disadvantage for the organization or for the, for the department. And budgets are clearly based on estimates. Estimates can really go long, go wrong, especially if economic situations change drastically or there is something really, uh, something that really changes drastically in the industry itself. So the entire budget estimates can go wrong. But make sure you explain these points or any other points properly and use all the space that is given so that you get proper marks. So that completes paper number 22. Now let's do paper number 32. Question number one, T Limited buys and sells standard furniture due to the increasing demand for furniture. T Limited rented a factory and also started manufacturing luxury furniture from 1st Jan 2021. The draft income statement for the year ended 31st December 2021 is given. Sales for both the type of furniture, opening inventory at cost for standard furniture, which is the item that is purchased. Then purchases for standard furniture and direct materials. This will be for manufacturing of the luxury furniture. Closing inventory is given. Direct materials, which is raw materials. Then work in progress. Finished goods of standard and luxury. 
cost of sales is given gross profit is given some expenses are given profit is given okay further information is also available directors consider that a manufacturing account should be prepared and the factory profit should be 20% on cost of goods so in the manufacturing account at the end they want us to add 20% on cost as factory profit and then transfer it to the income statement wages and salaries comprised of factory workers factory manager office staff and sales people so the factory workers wages are direct expenses or you can classify it as direct labor so it will go in the calculation of prime cost but factory manager is a factory overhead expense indirect cost it will go in the later part of the manufacturing account and office staff and sales staff will obviously go in the income statement depreciation comprised of office equipment motor vehicles for transportation of finished goods so this was not factory expense it is in the income statement and factory machines so this will go in the manufacturing account and these two will go in the income statement newly acquired factory machines had been depreciated at the annual rate of 25% by using reducing balance method it was decided that the annual rate should have been 20% instead and the income statement has to be amended so the factory machines 9000 this is calculated at a rate of 25% we need to amend it to 20% so how will you calculate the revised depreciation 9000 divided by 25% that will give you the original cost which comes to 36000 on that 20% so 7200 is the depreciation on factory machines that you want us to consider then next page other expenses include where do we have other expenses we have it here in the income statement total of 188000 so they telling you that 188000 other expenses that includes 32000 for factory rent Forty-six thousand for office rent. So factory rent will go in manufacturing, office rent will go in income statement. And out of the remaining, which is one eighty-eight minus seventy-eight, so one hundred and ten thousand. Out of this one hundred and ten thousand, twenty percent, which is twenty-two thousand, is attributable to indirect manufacturing cost, so manufacturing account. And eighty-eight thousand, which is eighty percent, is office admin expenses, so income statement. part a explain the term indirect manufacturing cost indirect manufacturing costs are costs that are incurred in the production activity in the manufacturing of products but those that cannot be directly associated with the unit items being produced they cannot be directly traced down to the items that are being purchased so that is the meaning of indirect manufacturing cost part b prepare the manufacturing account We'll do the manufacturing account here. We have some space here. Manufacturing account for the year thirty first December two thousand twenty one. We start with the calculation of prime cost, and that begins with the calculation of. raw materials consumed so raw materials consumed under that opening inventory of raw materials will obviously it will be zero because this is the first year when they are when they are starting the manufacturing plant so let's erase this so that we save space then purchase of raw material given purchase of direct material 76500 and no carriage inward is given or any other kind of direct material cost is not given so less closing inventory of raw materials 14200 so the raw materials consumed amount would be 62300 to this we will add our direct labor cost now if you read the question carefully or if you read the information given carefully wages and salaries bifurcation is given the first one was factory wages i told you this was direct labor cost so we will add factory worker wages and then 19000 there are no other direct expenses so we can calculate the prime cost 
by taking total of direct material consumed and direct labor cost which is 181,300. Now to this we will add our factory overheads. Factory overheads means all other costs in the factory that have been incurred not directly associated with the product. So if we go through the information carefully we have factory managers wages so wages of factory manager which is 36,000 then we have the depreciation on factory machines which was calculated as 7,200 by us and you can always put a number here let's say number one and show the calculations as working note below the answer you should always do that then apart from that we had factory rent 32,000 and the bifurcation was given for other expenses out of that 20 percent was out of 110,000 20 percent was manufacturing so 22,000 other factory cost 22,000 97,200 when we add the prime cost and the factory overheads we'll get the total amount spent in the factory 278,500 but we need to do the adjustment for work in progress there is no opening work in progress here as it's a new factory so we will deduct the closing work in progress which is given as 12,500 so the cost of manufacturing or cost of goods produced 266,000 now adjustment number one says add 20% factory profit so add factory profit 20% of this which will be 53,200 and then we can take the total and say transferred to income statement which is 319,200 that completes the manufacturing account. Part C prepare the revised income statement. Your statement should show separately the gross profit for each of the products standard furniture and luxury furniture and it should also show expenses split into total admin and total selling basically when we show our expenses we will write down the expenses as admin and selling in the income statement we'll show the working as a work uh, as a separate working note but in the income statement we'll just show admin expenses and distribution or selling expenses so let's erase this and we can do our income statement here part c what we're going to do is the calculation of gross profit has to be done for both the products separately so we'll do a, we'll first mention the products on top for calculation of gross profit then once our gross profit calculation is done we will then follow the normal income statement format so revenues uh, that was given in the income statement for both the products so 510,000 and 484,000 less cost of sales opening inventory purchases this will be applicable for standard and cost of manufacturing this will be applicable for luxury and then we will deduct our closing inventory So opening inventory for standard furniture, if you see the income statement given, it is 71,000. Opening inventory for luxury does not apply. It's the first year for luxury furniture. Purchases for 
standard furniture if you see here it is given as 292000 while cost of manufacturing for luxury would be 319 200 that we calculated in the manufacturing account and closing inventory for standard is 66500 so let's deduct that for luxury it is 35000 one thing that you have to notice it says closing inventory is given at cost but our cost of manufacturing 319 200 this is including the 20% profit so if your closing inventory you take it at cost that will not give you the correct cross profit so you will also have to mark up your closing inventory by additional 20% so 35,000 is given on that 20% is 7,000 so 42,000 you can put a mark here and show the calculation below how did you get it so 35,000 into 120 percent so calculating the cost of sales for both the products 71,000 plus 292 minus 66 500 so 296 500 while for luxury 319 200 minus 42,000 277 200 and then we will get our gross profit for each products which is 213,500 for standard and 206,800 for luxury so that completes our product wise calculation of gross profit what I'm going to do is I'm again going to start here and say total gross profit this is a way of presentation that I prefer. There may be other ways of presentation also that may be acceptable. So it's okay if you present it in any other way. So total gross profit 213,500 plus 206,800, 420,300. Now, do we have any other income in this? No, we don't have any other income. We will directly subtract our expenses so less expenses as mentioned in the question our expenses have to be divided into admin expenses and selling and distribution expenses we need to take the total of these two and write it then only we'll get our total expenses then we get our profit so let's calculate the expenses so for admin expenses, let's say working num note number two. So what all admin expenses we have? Let's go up. If we start reading the income statement given, we have covered everything. Okay, we've not covered wages and salaries. We've not covered office staff. So office staff 167, that will be there. Office staff salary 167,000 plus what else will be covered in admin sales people will go in the selling and distribution depreciation of office equipment will clearly go in office and office admin expenses 8600 so plus depreciation 8600 plus the 80 percent of that 110,000 that was of the other expenses so others 88,000 and also from point number 4 there is office rent of 46,000 so that we will have to take into account so the total admin expenses would be 309,600 now calculating the selling and distribution expenses let's say working note number 3 Sales staff salary, which was 44,000. So, sales staff then depreciation on the motor vehicles that is used for deliveries 
which was 10,500. And if we go on top, we have carriage outward here, 18,500. So that will be all for selling and distribution expenses and the total comes to 73,000. So the total of expenses we get is 382,600 and 400,200 minus 382,600. As of now we are getting a profit of 37,700 but this is not a final profit. Why? Because we still have to make the adjustment for notional factory profit and the unrealized profit on the closing inventory. The notional factory profit 53,200 that we added in the manufacturing account that is artificially increasing the cost and reducing the profit. So we will have to make that adjustment here, add factory notional profit. $53,200 and the $7,000 that we included in the closing inventory as the markup that is reducing the cost of sales and increasing the gross profit and net profit artificially. So that we will have to reduce from the profit so a less unrealized profit on closing inventory which was 7000 so then we get a final net profit as per income statement which will be 83900 part d assess the impact on the profitability of t limited for the year ended 31st december 2021 of manufacturing luxury furniture support your answer with appropriate calculations five marks so what kind of calculations can we do first of all if we look at the gross profit generated by luxury furniture is 206800 Obviously, there is some adjustment for notional profit also here, but it's okay. Overall, this luxury furniture department is generating a profit for the business. So we can say that, yes, it is a profitable uh, profitable venture, profitable aspect of the business. But to what extent? We will have to do some calculations. What kind of calculations can you do? You can compare the gross profit ratio of the standard and luxury to determine whether it is feasible for the business to continue you know, selling luxury furniture or they should put their effort into standard furniture because if the gross profit margin of standard furniture is higher than the luxury furniture, then probably they would want to focus more on standard. So for part D, what you can do is you can calculate the gross profit margin of standard, which will be the gross profit 213,500 divided by revenues of standard 510,000 multiplied by 100 so you get 41.86 percent and then you can also calculate the gross profit margin of luxury 206,800 divided by revenues of luxury furniture 484,000 into 100 so 52.27 percent clearly the gross profit margin of luxury furniture is higher is better so we it is okay or it is a good decision to have luxury furniture as one of their product lines so this is the financial aspect so probably you could get two or three marks for this two marks for calculation and one mark for advice based on this but since it's for five marks we can also give some non-financial justifications so when you have a separate product line it creates a better customer base for the business because when a customer is coming to buy one set of product, he might also end up buying the other product. So having an additional product line improves the sales of the other product line. That could be one of the justifications. And since the second product line is related to the first product line, the overall expenses of the business won't increase to that extent. Like expenses like admin expenses, those expenses don't increase proportionately. So it is always better to have similar product lines as uh, you know uh, to increase the revenue of the business and not increase the cost to that extent and you could also say that having more and more product lines 
opens up avenues for business expansion in future. So there are higher chances of this business expanding in form of, uh, let's say, having more branches or opening up in different regional areas. All these avenues also open up by having a profitable product line, a different product line that is profitable also. So you could include all these points. Question number two. X Limited provided the following information relating to its non-current assets at 1st Jan 2021. Cost, depreciation, book value for building, plant, motor vehicle, following transactions took place during the year 31st December 21. So all these values are at the opening. Building which has a useful life of 20 years was purchased on 1st Jan 16. It was revalued to 750,000 on 1st Jan 21. So before revaluing, it was already used for 16, 17, 18, 19 and 20. So five years it was already used. So remaining useful life would be 15 years. And the new value of the building was 750,000. So the depreciation, okay, we'll do the depreciation calculation later because at the end they've also mentioned the method and everything. We'll do the calculations later. For now, this is what we know. A new machine was purchased on 1st March 2021 costing 200,000. Other related costs were 11,000 installation, delivery 8,000, pre-production testing 5,000, repairs and maintenance for a 5-year contract 30,000. Now out of this the repairs cost, this is not a capital expenditure, this is a revenue expenditure. Even though it's a 5 years contract, so you can divide the expense over 5 years and put it as a revenue expenditure in the income statement because it is a recurring expense. But the first three can be capital expenditure. So the total cost of the machine will be 200,000 plus 24,000 the total of first three. So 224,000 will be the total cost of machine. Motor vehicle is a diesel lorry which was bought on 1st Jan 2019. It was it has an estimated useful life of five years with no residual value. Recent government Environmental policy urged X Limited to review the value of this lorry. The following information is given. Estimated value in use and selling price 21,000 but selling cost of 4,000 will have to be incurred. So the net selling price is 17,000. Depreciation policy is given. Building, plant and machinery, motor vehicles. Out of this plant and machinery is reducing balance 25%. Full years depreciation is charged in the year of purchase. Okay, explain why a business may need to impair its non-current assets since it's for three marks. So what you could write is you could mention about the IAS number which is IAS 36 as per IAS 36 assets have to be checked for their impairment at the end of every year and if the book value is higher than the recoverable value then assets will have to be impaired and then you can also say what is the meaning of recoverable value? Recoverable value is the higher of value in use and the fair value. And you could also mention about the logic, which is the prudence. All of this is based on the prudence concept so that assets are not overstated. So all of this will help you get three marks. Part B, explain to what extent the value of diesel lorry is to be impaired. Okay, we have to show the impairment calculation and impairment loss. So what we can do is, value in use is equal to 18,500 it's given and the fair value will be 21,000 minus 4,000 17,000 so the recoverable value is equal to higher of value in use and fair value which is 18,500 in this case because 18,500 is higher than 17,000. Now this will have to be compared to the book value on 31st December because all of these details of value in use and recoverable value are all given on 31st December. So book value has to be calculated on 31st December. Now you would think that let's take 36,000 as book value. No, you cannot do that because that book value is given on 1st Jan 2021. We want it at the end of the year. So we will have to provide one more year depreciation and then only we'll be able to get the 
बुक वैल्यू ऑन थर्टी फर्स्ट दिसंबर टू सो मोटो वेहीकल्स डेप्रीसिएशन पॉलिसी स्ट्रेट लाइन यूजफुल लाइफ इज फाइव ईयर्स सो एनुअल डेप्रीसिएशन फॉर मोटो वेहीकल विल बी द कॉस्ट सिक्सटी थाउजेंड लेट्स डू इट हियर सिक्सटी थाउजेंड डिवाइडेड बाई फाइव ट्वेल्व थाउजेंड दैट्स दी एनुअल डेप्रीसिएशन सो वट आई कैन डू इज बुक वैल्यू ऑन थर्टी फर्स्ट डिसम्बर विल बी डॉलर्स थर्टी सिक्स थाउजेंड माइनस डॉलर्स ट्वेल्व थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर थाउजेंड नाउ सिंस द बुक वैल्यू ट्वेंटी फोर थाउजेंड इज क्लियरली हायर दैन दी रिकवरेबल वैल्यू इट मीन्स करंटली दी एसेट इज ओवर स्टेटेड इन द बुक्स एंड हेंस वी विल हैव टू शो एन इम्पेयरमेंट लॉस हियर सो इम्पेयरमेंट लॉस इज इक्वल टू नेट बुक वैल्यू माइनस रिकवरेबल वैल्यू डॉलर्स फाइव थाउजेंड फाइव हंड्रेड डोंट शो एनी काइंड ऑफ एब्रीविएशन इन दी एग्जाम इट्स नॉट अलाउड आई एम जस्ट डूइंग इट हियर फॉर सिंप्लिसिटी और फॉर ईज ऑफ सॉल्विंग दिस पेपर That completes part B. Prepare the non-current asset schedule in the format suitable for inclusion in notes. A total column is not required. So, as per the international accounting standard, sixteen uh, on property, plant, and equipment, companies have to present a non-current asset schedule in their notes to accounts. That shows the presentation of all their non-current assets. We have to provide a similar schedule. So, let's do it here now. In this schedule, there will be a separate column for all categories of assets. So, in this case, the business is having three categories. Building, plant and machinery and motor vehicle. Now, what happens in a non-current asset schedule? First, you present all the details about the cost of the asset. In that, you will have to present the opening balance, whatever additions have happened, whatever disposals have happened, whatever adjustments like impairment, like revaluation, all of that has to be shown, and finally the closing balance. Same way, the second part, you will have to present all the details about the depreciation on that asset. Under that, the same format: opening balance, new depreciation provided during the year. any kind of disposals any adjustments for revaluation for impairment and finally the closing balance and then net book value has to be shown opening and closing so this is the overall format of the non current asset schedule we are going to follow the same so let's start with the cost so we will have opening balance for each asset Let's see if there is any addition of new asset during the year. Yes, motor new machine was purchased, so we will have to show a row for additions. If there is any disposal, we would show disposal. So, is there any disposal? No, there is no disposal done during the year, so we will skip that. Apart from that, there is revaluation, so we will have to show something for revaluation. Then we will have to show. impairment adjustment because the motor vehicle is being impaired and finally the closing balance so that will be your cost section then for accumulated depreciation opening balance any additional depreciation that we are providing on the assets for this year disposals are not there revaluation adjustment will be there impairment adjustment is there and then the closing balance and then we will show the net book value closing and opening so let's begin the first we'll fill out the building then we will do the plant and machinery so the opening of building if we see opening cost is 600000 accumulated depreciation is 150000 so opening cost 
accumulated appreciation opening 150,000 and opening net book value is 450,000. Then for building, there are no additions, but there is a revaluation. So what is the revaluation amount? See, they have to show the revalued building at 750,000. So currently the building is at 600,000. So we will have to add additional 150,000 for the revaluation so that the total becomes 750,000. Additions is zero, impairment is zero. And the depreciation, 150,000, that has to be reversed. So whenever an asset is revalued, the accumulated depreciation on that day, that has to be reversed. And going forward, you'll have to calculate fresh depreciation and provide in the books for the remaining useful life. Since the revaluation is done on 1st Jan 2021, the 150,000, which is the accumulated depreciation on that date, we will reverse that but we will have to provide the depreciation for 2021. If this revaluation was done on 31st December 2021, then I would have provided depreciation as per the old calculations, as per the old value, old useful life. But since revaluation is done on 1st Jan and we are using the asset in 2021, so on 31st December, we will be doing depreciation calculations as per the latest calculations, which is the latest book value 750,000 or latest fair value divided by the remaining useful life, which we already calculated as 15 years. So dollars 50,000. So for depreciation 50,000 and impairment, no question for building. So closing balance is 50,000. And hence the closing book value becomes 700,000, which is 750 minus 50. That completes the building cost. Now starting with plant and machinery, opening cost 400,000, opening depreciation 160,000. So 400,000, 160,000. So opening book value 240,000. Then for plant and machinery, what do we have? We have new addition to plant and machinery. We decided that the cost would be 224,000. So let's put that in the additions, 224,000. No revaluation for plant and machinery, no impairment. So total 624,000. For accumulated depreciation, we'll have to calculate the depreciation based on reducing balance 25% rate. So how would you do the calculations? Let's say number two, the closing cost is 624,000. The accumulated depreciation is 160,000. So the book value, closing book value or the book value before providing depreciation that multiplied by 25%. So 25% we get 116,000. So that we're going to put here 116,000, no revaluation, no impairment. So 276,000. So the closing book value would be 624 minus 276, 348,000. For motor vehicle, opening balance 660,000, accumulated depreciation 24,000, 6024 and opening book value. 36,000 additions. There are no additions for motor vehicle. There is no revaluation for motor vehicle, but there is impairment. But before impairing, what did we do? We provided 12,000 additional depreciation because if you see how did we calculate our book value 24,000, we first provided additional depreciation 12,000. So what we're going to do, we're going to go here, provide additional depreciation 12,000. So that makes the accumulated depreciation 36,000. Now at the time of impairment, again, like revaluation, we will have to make our accumulated depreciation equal to zero again, because going forward, we will again depreciate using the new value. So the total depreciation 
36,000, we will put it as impairment so that the book value becomes zero. Now for motor vehicle, how much do we want the uh, latest book value to be after impairment? 18,500 because that was the recoverable value and our book value was 24,000 but we wanted at 18,500. Now to make the motor vehicle final value equal to 18,500, how much will you have to deduct in the impairment section? 60,000 minus 18,500, 41,500. So in the impairment, no, not here, 41,500. So that makes the closing balance of motor vehicle as 18,500. Depreciation, we made it zero. So the closing book value is 18,500. Going forward, you will provide depreciation on 18,500. Another way of calculating this 41,500 would be to see how much is the impairment loss, which is 5,500 we calculated in part B, plus the total depreciation or accumulated depreciation as on date, with date which we are reversing. Since we are reversing it from the depreciation, we will have to reverse it in the cost also, which is 36,000. So again, total 41,500. It's the same value. So that completes our net uh, net sorry non current asset schedule going to part d advise the directors whether or not okay before that additional information rip, the repair and maintenance cost 30000 for five year contract for the new machine was paid on 1st march 2021 advise the directors whether or not x limited should have entered into the contract justify your answer so since it is for five marks let's say we do it here part d since it is for five marks, first we can say some points for it, then we can say some point points against it and at the end give a conclusion. So for entering the contract, the justification for it would be that when you enter into a service contract, it is the cost of service and repairs is much cheaper compared to if you don't, if compared to if a situation where you don't enter a contract and every time you have to spend a lot of money. So cheaper compared to a situation where it is not entered into a contract and since the business already is, is has a contract with the company so it will make sure that it it makes use of the contract and whenever there's a problem with the machine the servicing and the repairs will be done on time so it improves the life of the asset also if you don't have a contract then repairs might be delayed servicing might be delayed because of the cost factor involved so it improves the life of the asset against Maybe the life of the asset may not be that much or maybe the asset might be irrelevant, maybe obsolete or might lose its useful life before the end of five years. So entire contract may not be used. And you're paying for the entire five years at the current stage. So a lot of money has to be paid up front. So it affects the working capital or affects the cash balances in the business. And at the end, you can give justification, which will carry one mark. Any kind of justification is okay, but you can say for it also, or you can say against it also. So, that completes question number two. Question number three, the statements of financial position. The statement of financial position for W limited are as follows. 2021 closing and 2020 opening are given non current assets cost depreciation, cost, depreciation, current assets, inventory, receivables, cash and cash equivalents. Then for equity, ordinary share capital is given, share premium, revaluation reserve is there, retained earnings is there, non-current liabilities only one, 12% debentures is there, then current liabilities, trade payables and bank overdraft is there. Then the following information is given. Okay, let's see what we have to do first. Okay, part A, explain what is meant by the term cash and cash equivalents. Part B is prepare the cash flow statement. Okay, so this is a cash flow statement question. Now we'll read the adjustments accordingly 
if we already know in advance what are we doing later we will read the adjustments accordingly and at the same time we will make our notes cost of land and building at 31st december 2020 comprised of land 250000 buildings 400000 the land which is not depreciated has been revalued to 330000 on 1st of july so this 650000 this is 250 for land and 400 for building now this 100 and uh, 1150 1150 out of this how much would be land it will not be 250 it has been now revalued to 330 so how much would be the building difference 1150 minus 330 820 is the cost of building if you compare the cost of building earlier it was 400000 currently it is 820 so what does it mean it means that there is an addition to the cost of building 420000 so if there is no disposal or no other adjustment then we can say that buildings have been purchased to the extent of 420000 on 1st march a final dividend for 2020 of 0.2 dollars per share was paid okay an addition additional 200 equity ordinary uh, sorry additional 200000 ordinary shares were issued on 1st april which is during the year if you see ordinary share capital has increased from 400 to 600 so that means 200000 has been received for this share premium has also increased from 70 to 120 so 50000 has been received for this on 1st september 2021 interim dividend of 0.1 dollar per share was paid on all the shares issued on that date so when we are doing this we will also take into account the new shares because new shares were issued on 1st april during the year ended 31st December 2021 inter an item of plant and machinery costing 12000 was sold for 3000 at a profit of 2000 so sale value is 3000 so that will be our inflow in the uh, in investing activity now profit 2000 we will adjust it in the operating activity apart from this we will also have to use this information to see whether there is an addition in the plant and equipment cost also or no in the also okay apart from that we will also have to see whether there is a what is the additional depreciation in the plant section that because that will also be adjusted in the operating activity in the year to 31st december 2021 all interest due 44000 has been paid so clearly they are telling you that this is the interest that you will be considering if this was not given what would we do you would see 12% of 200000 24000 would be the interest that we would consider because then we would assume that this 50000 repayment of debenture that has happened at the end of the year so 12% of 200000 we would have taken but they are telling you that 44000 is the total interest probably some interest has been paid out bank overdraft also and that is why it's 44000 we don't have to analyze this we'll clearly take into account 44000 so starting with question number a explain what is meant by the term cash and cash sorry cash equivalence cash means the cash and bank balances but if you see cash flow statement there is a term called cash equivalence also so cash equivalence are highly liquid investments that you've made for a very short term that can be converted into cash as and when you want it and without any significant loss in the value of those investments so sometimes if you invest in in an asset and if you want to sell it immediately you might have to incur some loss because maybe that asset is not very liquid or maybe the value fluctuates a lot that is not cash and cash equivalence so that is not cash equivalence cash equivalence is something that is highly liquid where the value is stable so you can convert it into cash in the very short term as and when you want it without any significant loss in the value so such investments are called cash equivalence example like bank deposits so you don't have to give examples you have to just state the meaning of cash equivalence prepare the statement of cash flow state uh, statement of cash flow now cash flow statement begins with the uh, with the operating profit profit from operations they have not given us any clue about the net profit for the year or about the profit from operations so we will have to do that calculation first so part b working note calculation of profit from operations So how would you calculate your profit from operations see when you prepare the income statement 
let's say you prepared the whole income statement at the end you get the net profit somewhere here you have the operating profit or the profit from operations what is there in between the finance cost basically the interest cost so if we somehow get our net profit and we add back the interest cost we will arrive at our operating profit how do we get our net profit eventually the net profit of the income statement goes to the retained earning section so we can compare the retained earning section and see what is the difference that difference will be the addition in the retained earning section and that will be the net profit obviously some other adjustments would also be there but at least let's begin with the calculation closing retained earnings minus opening retained earnings overall the difference will give us the net profit made during the year but then in the retained earnings section there are other adjustments also like transfer to general reserve is there sometimes bonus issue can be made dividends are paid all of these will also be have to adjusted so that we know the correct difference in the retained earnings only due to the net profit added now if you see there is no general reserve creation or no general reserve transfer but there is payment of dividend final dividend is paid and interim dividend is paid so we will have to add back the interim dividend and also add back the final dividend so let's put the values closing retained earnings is 136000 opening retained earnings is 109000 now interim dividend 0.1 dollars per share that will have to be calculated on the new value of ordinary share capital or new number of ordinary shares which is 600000 shares into dollar 0.1 60000 and final dividend of 0.2 dollars per share has to be calculated on the old number of ordinary shares before the share issue so for 400000 into 0.2 80000 now what is this giving us okay let's write it on the left hand side this is just giving us the net profit not the profit from operations so if we do this calculation we get net profit as 167000 now from net profit how will we calculate our profit from operations so net profit and we will add back the interest that was charged in the income statement so 167000 plus 44000 adjustment number 6 so 211000 so this will be a starting point of the cash flow statement so let's start with the cash flow statement so profit from operations in bracket you can say working note 211 we can take it as dollars 1000 i just i just want to know whether there would be any decimal issues or no later okay let's take it as dollars 1000 because the entire balance sheet is given that way so we'll do it that way 211000 now to this we will have to make adjustments for first of all all the non cash items that are included in the income statement and also the non operating elements that have been or non operating transactions that have been included in the income statement because we are trying to calculate cash flow from operating activities if i talk about the non cash items the depreciation is there so add depreciation on building and plant and equipment so we will write them separately we will have to calculate these values so we will just do that in a bit apart from this what else do we have there was profit on disposal so this will be subtracted so less profit on disposal of plant now this value is given directly 2000 so that i'm going to write it as negative 2000 
So that is it. No other non-cash or non-operating transactions are there. Let's calculate the depreciation. Now what I'll do is I'll prepare a depreciation on building account, accumulated depreciation on building account. I'm quickly preparing a T account. You have to do all these workings with your no working note section. I don't have space below, so I'm doing it on top. On the credit side, we would have 160,000. Then income statement on the credit side will be the annual depreciation. We don't know this yet. Balance carry down on the credit side would be 200, 1000. So the difference between the opening and closing will be the depreciation, which is 41,000. Because there is no revaluation of building, there's only revaluation of land. If building was also revalued, then I would have made adjustments on the debit side of accumulated depreciation account. But they're telling you clearly that land was only revalued, building was not revalued. So the 41,000, I'm going to enter it in the cash flow statement entered. Okay. Now we will also prepare the depreciation on plant and equipment. So accumulated depreciation on plant and equipment. Opening balance is 274,000. Closing balance is 326,000. Now since plant was disposed, so there will be a transaction on the debit side for disposal. This will be the accumulated depreciation on plant and equipment sold. Now, if we go back to adjustment number five, what would be the value of accumulated depreciation on plant equipment sold? Now, 3000 was the sale value. Profit was 2000. So I can say that the net book value would be 1000. If net book value is 1000 and cost is 12,000, I can say that accumulated depreciation would be the difference 11,000. So on the debit side of the account, 11,000. So income statement will appear as the balancing figure on the credit side, 337, 337, 63,000. Now this we will enter in the cash flow statement. Now let's consider the adjustments or the differences or the changes in the current assets and current liabilities. Inventory is increasing so any increase in inventory or for that matter increase in any current asset would always be subtracted so less increase in inventory 28,000 then if we see the debtors that is also increasing by 32,000 so again let's deduct that less increase in Trade receivables 32,000. The cash and cash equivalence is never considered here. And in the current liabilities, trade payables is decreasing. Now decrease in trade payables will also be deducted. So less decrease in trade payables. Thirty-four thousand. And if you look, there is no other current liability. Bank overdraft is there, but that we will consider with cash and cash equivalence. So all of this gets us 219,000. This is called cash generated from operations. Once you get this, the next step is to deduct the interest paid and the tax paid. In this case, in this question, there is no taxation. So we are just going to deduct the interest paid. So less interest paid, 44,000. So cash, net cash from operating activities, 175,000. We had to give the heading here on top, operating activities. Please do that. Okay, then we have the second section, investing activities. Now under investing activities, any purchase or sale of non-current assets and investments is considered. If you look at the building section, we had decided that 420,000 worth of building was purchased. That will be outflow. Then coming to plant and equipment section, we'll have to prepare a T account for plant and equipment cost. 
because then we will get our value of plant purchased during the year. So I'll just prepare it here. Plant and equipment. Now balance brought down is 500, sorry, 450, 4,000. Balance carried down is 539,000. Disposal cost 12,000, adjustment number five. So the difference Ninety-seven thousand is the value of plant purchased. So this will also be an outflow. And apart from this, sale of plant that will be an inflow. So three transactions. So purchase of building. Four hundred twenty. Purchase of plant. Ninety-seven thousand and sale or disposal of plant. We sold it for 3000, so plus three. The net value is negative 514,000, which is net cash used in investing activities. Then financing activities. In financing activities, we'll have to see the change in our capital structure, equity, non-current liabilities. So ordinary share capital has increased by 200 plus share premium 50, 250,000. That'll be issue of ordinary shares. Then revaluation reserve, it was from the revaluation of land, but it's a non-cash transaction. We will not consider it in the cash flow statement. Then debentures have been repaid to the extent of 50,000 that will be an outflow and finally the interim and final dividend paid that will also be considered so issue of ordinary shares in bracket you can say including premium so the value including premium was 200 plus 50 250,000 then a repayment or redemption of debentures fifty thousand and then the payment of final dividend and interim dividend so final dividend paid and interim dividend paid the final dividend paid was eighty thousand interim dividend was sixty thousand so the net figure is 60,000. This is cash, net cash flow from financing activities. At the end, you will have to show the total cash that is generated during the year or used from the business in the business. So overall, it's a negative outflow or it's a negative cash use or it, you can say it's a it's a, a net outflow 175 minus 514 plus 60 so net cash used during the year minus 279,000 now if you see the opening cash in cash equivalents it is 37,000 so we will have to add that here add opening cash in cash equivalence 37,000 we should be able to arrive at our closing cash and cash equivalence which is 242,000 let's see if this is matching with our balance sheet closing cash and cash equivalence if you see the value of bank overdraft it is 242,000 so it is clearly matching and it means overall our answer is correct. So that completes cash flow statement. Part C, explain two reasons why a business prepares a statement of cash flow in addition to an income statement and statement of financial position. So the income statement tells you about the profit made on accrual basis, but it does not tell you how much of that profit is realized in cash. Cash flow statement helps to explain the extent to which the profit was that was made during there was realized in cash 
Also, cash flow statement helps us to understand the inflows and outflows of cash under the main activities of the cash flow statement and uh, helps us to understand from where the cash is being generated and where is it being used. That information is also important. For example, if a lot of cash outflow is there in the operating activity and to the same extent or even higher than that, there is a cash inflow in the financing activities. What does that mean? That means you're raising cash through financing activities, but all of that is, that is going as a loss in the operating activity. So that is not a very desirable situation, even though there would be a net positive cash flow. So when you understand how the cash is being used or generated under various activities, it helps us to analyze the business better or improve the situation better in future. So these two reasons can be stated. Part D, during the director's meeting, the finance director had been asked why he had raised a bank overdraft to finance the acquisition of non-current assets. So advise the director whether or not the finance director was correct in raising a bank overdraft. So for you can write for the raising of bank overdraft two points against bank overdraft two points and at the end give a justification. So for bank overdraft, you can say that it's a it's an easy way to raise quick finance, less legal formalities are involved and the cost of raising finance is very less Then the it, in, it increases the working capital that is available to the business on a day-to-day -day basis. All these are advantages of raising bank overdraft. Then against bank overdraft, you can say that normally the cost of inter the cost of uh, financing the business using bank overdraft or in other words, the interest cost associated with bank overdraft is very high compared to the interest cost associated with a long term loan. So that way the interest cost will be very high. And since the non current assets are or will be used for a long period, obviously non current assets, they have a long useful life. So it is always better to finance their acquisition by a long term loan because since the revenues are being generated over a long period. So even the cost of the loan, which is the interest cost that also can be paid over a long period over the useful life. And hence it is okay to take a long term loan to finance the non current purchase of non current assets. And at the end you can uh, give a justification. I think if I was uh, writing this paper, I would say that he's not really very uh, correct in in uh, taking a bank overdraft to purchase a non current asset because the because of the high interest cost and because the terms and conditions associated with the bank overdraft are not very favorable for any business. So you can give this or if you want to give a justification for it, you can also say that probably they are expecting cash inflows in the coming period in the short term and hence they are okay to raise a quick finance using the bank overdraft option. So any justification is okay. Okay. Question number four is on consignment. And since consignment is out of syllabus, I'm not going to do this particular question. If you want to learn consignment, if you want to learn about this topic, there are videos available in the financial accounting playlist, ASA level financial accounting playlist. You can uh, see the, see how to solve such questions there. Question number five. Why limited produces one product budgeted units produced and sold for the month of July were thousand further budgeted information for July was also available sales, material cost, labor cost, fixed overheads and budgeted profit 66,000. All of this is for budgeted output of thousand units, fixed overheads to be absorbed based on labor hours. Actual output was one, one, two, zero part a prepare the flexed budget to show the budgeted profit for month of July. Flexed budget means we'll have to flex the quantity. So these budgeted numbers are for thousand units. We will have to prepare a new budget wherein we will change the quantity to one, one, two, zero units. So what I'll do is I'll just prepare it in the same format. I'll continue here only. So sales 250,000 for thousand units, which means for one unit, it is $250. So $250 into 1120, 280,000 material cost $60 per unit multiplied by 1120. 
67,200. Labor cost, $100 per unit multiplied by 1120. So 112,000. And fixed overheads, $24 per unit into 1120. 26,880. So the budgeted profit should be $66 per unit into 1120, $73,920. So if you, even if you check the total, you will get the same answer as $73,920. So continuing, additional information, the actual results for the month of July is also available. Sales, material cost, labor cost, fixed overheads and actual profit. The cost accountant is going to conduct a variance analysis for the July performance state what is meant by variance analysis variance analysis involves comparing the actual performance actual data to the standard data and to see the variance in the performance and to analyze the reasons for that variance to establish responsibility or to give due credit for any favorable performance that is the meaning of variance analysis calculate the following part C so we have to calculate certain variances so let's start part C number one in that sales price variance which will be the difference between budgeted price and actual price multiplied by actual quantity sold the budgeted price is $250 minus Actual price, what we can do is, we can also have a separate working note below the answer. First one, actual selling price is equal to dollars to triple seven six zero divided by one one two zero. So $248, so $248 multiplied by actual quantity of one one two zero. So $2 into 1120. 2240 adverse why because the actual selling price is less than the budgeted uh, selling price so lower selling price will lead to lower profits and hence adverse variance number two sales volume variance so here we have to begin with the difference in the volume which is budgeted quantity minus actual quantity and multiply that with the budgeted selling price so the Budgeted quantity was 1000, actual quantity was 1120 multiplied by $250 is the budgeted selling price. So if we calculate, we get a variance of 30,000. Now this will be a favorable variance. Why? Because the actual quantity is higher, it leads to higher profits. Number three, direct material total variance. Now, material cost variance or labor cost variance in total is always equal to the standard cost for actual output minus actual cost of raw materials. Now, standard cost of actual output is what? We've already prepared a flexed budget where we calculated that if 1120 units are produced, the standard cost for that is going to be 67,000. 200 so we have to just pick it up from there $67,200 and actual cost is given 72,688 so taking the difference 5,488 adverse because actual cost is higher than the standard cost direct labor variance same formula, standard cost minus actual cost. Again, standard cost is available from part A, our flex budget, 112,000 minus actual cost is 128,000, 520. So 16,520, again adverse, actual cost is higher than the standard cost. And fifth one is fixed overhead total variance, fixed overhead variance, which will be equal to absorbed overheads 
minus actual overheads. Absorbed overheads we can get from the part A 26880. So 26880 minus actual fixed overheads 25600. So 120, 1280, but favorable because actual money spent was less than what was absorbed or what was recovered from the customers. So that leads to a favorable variance. So we complete part C here. Then the directors are interested in further analyzing the variances in direct material. Our total direct material variance was 5488 adverse. So D part one, calculate two variances which would combine to give the direct material total variance. Now, as you know, for direct material variance, the sub variances would be direct material usage variance and direct material price variance. For usage, the formula would be the standard quantity required for actual output minus the actual quantity consumed multiplied by the standard price of the raw material. While for direct material price variance, it will be the difference between standard price and actual price multiplied by the actual quantity of raw material consumed. Now let's see what will be the standard quantity of raw materials required. The standard quantity of raw material required for the actual output would be this standard cost is 67200. So if we take this $67,200 and divide it by the $12 per kg, which is the standard price. So $67,200 divided by 12, we will get $5,600, which means for 1120 units of output, the expectations of the management is that 5,600 kgs of raw materials will be consumed. Now let's check what is the actual raw material consumed. 72,688 was spent and on every kg dollars 11.8 was spent or it was purchased for dollars 11.8 so how many kgs of raw materials was you uh, purchased and used 6160 kgs so we are going to take the difference of this and multiply it with the standard price of raw materials which is 12 dollars per kg so 5600 minus 6160 into dollars 6720 adverse because as per management's expectation they should have consumed 5600 units but they consumed a higher quantity of raw material and hence higher cost for the business. Now calculating direct material price variance we'll have to take the difference between standard price and actual price of the raw materials. Standard price was $12 per kg actual price was dollars 11.8 per kg multiplied by actual quantity of raw materials consumed we already calculated above 6160 so 6160 into 0.2 dollars 1232 favorable because they ended up buying the raw materials at a cheaper price and hence they were able to save money so favorable variance now in D part number two, explain the likely causes of variances calculated in D part one. If you see the direct material usage variance is adverse while the price variance is favorable. So for price variance, you could simply say that the reasons could be that the business has changed the supplier of raw material or has negotiated better trade discounts for the raw material or maybe bought in bulk and is able to get better trade discounts or you could also say fall in the prices general prices of raw materials that is also possible while for number one usage you could say that a fall in the quality of raw materials and you could also say inefficiency by labor in using the raw materials so any of these reasons you can use to explain additional information in July 
While Limited Ed has adopted a new strategy to increase sales by reducing the selling price, advise the directors of While Limited whether or not the company should continue the strategy in the long run. So if you realize the selling price was budgeted at 250, but they ended up selling it at 248. So that's that was the strategy, and they expected initially to sell a thousand units, but they ended up selling 1120 units. So is it uh, positive or is it not positive for the firm? This strategy. Let's analyze. If we compare the sales price variance and the volume variance now because of the fall in selling price the fall in profits is just $2,240 but because of the rise in uh, volume the increase in profit is $30,000 so to this extent yes there is a there is definitely an increase in the overall revenue of the firm so that is one positive thing but if we look at the cost variances in general the material cost is adverse, the labor cost is adverse and fixed overheads is favorable but just marginally and anyways fixed overheads are less dependent on the, the actual overheads of uh, actual fixed overheads are less dependent on the volume anyways. We will focus our discussion on material and labor. Why would material and labor become adverse or why would the business end up spending more on material and labor because of higher quantity? Probably. Uh, if you talk about material, probably there's a shortage of raw material in the market. Probably there are less number of suppliers in the market who would provide material, uh, the material at the same quality and same price. And when it comes to labor, maybe the business is already operating at full capacity. It has to hire additional labor and pay them overtime wages. Higher rate of wages is paid because of the overtime. The labor is not at their best, not showing the best performance. There is fatigue. So these reasons show that because of increase in output, there is a increase in cost here. There is an increase in cost. Now, finally, if we compare the profit, the standard profit for 1120 output or uh, units of output was expected to be 73,920, but the business ended up uh, earning only $50,952. So this tells us that even though uh, lowering the selling price would lead to higher volume, but probably the business is not in a good state to produce all the output at lower cost and supply and hence it will not, it is not very profitable to operate or to sell in bigger volumes. Hence the business may tr uh, try to not follow the strategy in the coming period. If you talk about non-financial aspects, you can also speak about that, that in the short term, the company may, you know, manage with lower profits, but try to increase its revenue, try to increase its uh, its uh, turnover and in future once the company is able to achieve a consistent high consistently higher turnover then it can plan to increase its capacity produce higher output at lower cost and eventually become more profitable that approach is also okay if you want to explain in that way so that completes our question number five and finally we come to last question question number six the directors of J Limited plan to buy a machine costing 550,000. Machine has a useful life of four years, no residual value. It is expected that a machine will generate a net cash flow of 200,000 for each of the first two years, followed by a decrease of 10% in year three, and further decrease in, of 10% in year four. Cost of capital is 10%. Discounting factors are given for 10% and 16%. Whenever they give you cost of capital 10%, for net present value, you will always take discounting factor of that cost of capital. Explain what is meant by the term cost of capital. Cost of capital means the cost at which the business is able to raise its finance or the business is able to source finance from or raise finance from various sources like debt or ordinary share capital or equity capital. So that explanation is okay. Calculate for the proposed investment payback period. Okay, let's start with payback period. Now, initial investment is 550,000. So in what period is the business recovering its initial investment? Year one cash flow is 200,000. Year two cash flow is another 200,000. While year three cash flow is 180,000. 
So at the end of year three, the business is recovering 580,000. So it means the payback period is somewhere between second and third year. So the payback period will be equal to two years plus in two years only 400,000 is recovered. We need to recover additional 150,000 in the third year to achieve payback period. But total cash flows for the third year are 180,000. This will be multiplied by 12 to arrive to achieve to uh, get the uh, get this uh, decimal it will come in decimals to get this in number of months so two years plus 10 months this will be the payback period number one number two accounting rate of return so the formula for accounting rate of return is average annual profits divided by average investment in the project project multiplied by 100 let's calculate average annual profit first so average annual profit now the total cash flows for the four years would be 200,000 plus 200,000 plus 180,000 and in the fourth year falling by additional 10% which means 162,000 so that makes it equal to 742,000 this is the total cash flow that they're going to receive in the four years but for profit we need to deduct the depreciation in these four years depreciation is going to be 550,000 the total cost of machine in these four years so the total profit that they're going to make in the four years is 742,000 divide minus 550,000 we'll have to divide it by the total life of the project which is four years then we will get the average annual profit which is 48,000 and what about average investment in the project average investment is always calculated as opening value of the investment which is 550,000 plus closing value of investment which is zero because no no value at the end of useful life divided by two which gives us 275,000 so 48,000 divided by 275,000 into 100 is 17.45 percent then the third is the calculation of net present value so this we will do using a table year cash flow discounting factor and present value of the cash flow please don't use abbreviations please give proper headings to this all the statements so year 0 1 2 3 and 4 cash flow is minus 550,000 then 200,000 each in year 1 and 2 180,000 160,000 discounting factor I told you we will be taking for 10% cost of capital which is given in the question okay for year 0 it is going to be 1 year 1 0.909 year 2 0.826 and 0.683 you'll have to multiply for each years and then at the end you will get the NPV as $42,826 then number four calculate the IRR what you're supposed to do you're supposed to prepare the same table again to calculate the present value or the net present value of the project at 16% cost of capital which is given because for IRR we need net present values at two rates one giving a positive NPV and one giving a negative NPV positive NPV is already available at 10% when we use 16% we will get a negative NPV so you will list down the discounting factors for 16% 1 0 0.8 0 0.862, 0 0.743, 0 0.641 and 0 0.552 present value you will calculate and then at the end you will arrive at a negative NPV of 24,196. You will not do this calculation in the same table in part 3, you will have to prepare a separate table in part 4 
and then you will use the formula of IRR which is the rate giving positive NPV plus in brackets the rate giving negative NPV minus the rate giving positive NPV multiplied by the fraction which is in the numerator the positive NPV 42 826 and in the denominator positive NPV plus negative NPV 24,000 plus 196. So when you simplify this, you will get 13,000, sorry, 13.83 percent. So that completes IRR calculation also. The directors decide to use NPV method for the investment appraisal due to the recent adverse economic conditions. The directors think that they should use a cost of capital of 16 percent. Okay, before that, part C. We forgot part C. Advise the directors whether or not the company should purchase the machine. Justify your answer. If you look at all the methods, payback period is well within the life of the asset, two years and 10 months, which is much ahead of four years. So yes, as per payback period, you should purchase. As per the accounting rate of return, though it is 17.45%, but you don't have any other, uh, any other benchmark to compare this. So in your explanation, you can skip this. You can, you may not mention about this or even if you do, you can say that it is a positive accounting rate of return. So as per accounting rate of return, also we can go ahead as per net present value. Definitely it, the 10% discounting factor leads to positive NPV. You should go ahead with the project. And if you see the inter, uh, internal rate of return is 13.83% and as per the internal rate of return method, it is higher than the cost of capital which means that you are spending 10% to source your finance, but you're making 13.83% on your project. So it is okay to go ahead with the investment as per IRR method also. So overall, yes, the director should purchase the machine. Additional information, the directors decide to use the NPV method for investment appraisal due to the rec recent adverse economic conditions. The directors think that they should use a cost of capital of 16%. Explain the impact on the director's decision to purchase the machine if cost of capital is 16%. So if the cost of capital is 16%, using the NPV method, the net present value is coming to negative 24196. So the directors should not purchase the machine. So the rise in cost of capital is affecting the director's decision adversely and the decision now changes to not purchasing the machine. That's part D. In view of the increase in cost of capital to 16%, the directors consider that the net cash inflows for each year need to be improved. Calculate the net cash flow for each of the four years. I mean the net cash inflows for, okay, net cash inflows for each of the four years so that the NPV of the proposed investment is zero. Okay, what they are trying to tell you is if we somehow increase the net cash flows of each year by some amount, so that eventually our net present value, which is currently 24 negative 24, 196, eventually it becomes positive. So what is it or what should be the annual cash flows for each year? So that eventually our NPV under 16% becomes zero. So let's see how we can do this. I will tell you a very easy method, a little bit mathematical, but at least a bit logical method. Let's say that the let the annual increase in cash flow of year one be x. So present value of additional cash flow of year one will be if you see the 16% discounting factor, it is 0.862. So the present value of the additional cash flow will be 0.862x. And present value of additional cash flow of year 2 will be 0.743xy. Because whatever is the additional cash flow in year 1, that is also going to be the additional cash flow in year 2 because year 1 and year 2 cash flows are the same. So we for if one for year 1 we are assuming x year two also will be X and, but the discounting discounted, uh, discounted value of year two cash flow will be lower because of higher discounting or lower discounting factor, higher discounting period. 
then present value of additional cash flow of year 3 is equal to see if year 1 and year 2 cash flows were x so year 3 cash flows is going to be 0.9x why because year 3 cash flow has to be 10 percent lower than year 2 cash flow but this has to be multiplied by the discounting factor 641.641 so 0.9x into 0.641 0.5769x and present value of additional cash flow of year 4 again 0.81x so we are discounting or we are reducing the cash flow by another 10% in year 4 so 90% of 0.9x is 0.81x this will have to be multiplied by the discounting factor of year 4 0.552 so 0 0.44712x so what will be the total present value of additional cash flows which means if you increase the year 1 year 2 cash flow by x x and year 3 by 90% of that and year 4 by uh, another 90% discount to that what is what will be the total present value of all these additional cash flows so for that you will have to take the total of all these above present values so you will get 2.62902x and to get the NPV as 0 under 16% our present value of additional cash flows if it is at least equal to positive 24196 that will cancel out this negative 24196 and we will get an NPV as 0. So we will try to equate this 2.62902x equal to 24196. So for NPV to be equal to 0, 2.62902x has to be equal to 24196. Six, so x in this case is going to be dollars nine thousand two hundred three is coming to point four three. Let's say we rounded off to nine thousand two hundred three. We'll keep it as a whole number. Now additional cash flow for year one is going to be nine thousand two hundred three. So actually the question is telling you find out the annual cash flows, find the net cash inflows for each year, not the additional cash flow. So we, we will take our old cash flows for each year and add the additional cash flow. So next step you can do is cash flow for year one is going to be 200,000 plus 9203, for year 2 it is going to be again the same because year 1 and year 2 cash flows are same. For year 3 what you can do is you can take directly 90% of this. So 209203 into 90% 188 283 and for year 4 you are going to take 90% of this again. So 169,455. Why am I taking 90% of the previous year? Because if you see the additional, the total cash flows for year 3 will be the old cash flows which is 180,000 plus 90% of the additional cash flow which is 9203. Eventually you'll get the same answer. Because this 180,000 is also 90% of 200,000. So since both are 90% of the previous year's cash flow, we are taking the total previous year's cash flow, multiplying it by 90%, we will get this. Just show the working, how did you get this and this 90% of the previous year cash flow. So that completes the question. If the 10% discount was not there in year 3 and then again in year 4, the question would have been much simple. In that case, what you would have done, you would have said that year 1 cash flow is X. So present value of additional cash flows like for year 1 is 0 0.862 point 0 0.862 plus for 
year two it is going to be point seven four three x for year three it is going to be point six four one x for year four this is going to be point five five two x you will take the total whatever you get you will equate it to twenty four thousand one ninety six then you will get the value of some value of x that will be the additional cash flow in each year you can just add it to the cash flows of each year but the problem is in year three and year four there is a discount of ten percent each compared to previous year and that is why this adjustment of zero point nine x and point eight one x is important. Otherwise, the final cash flows that you will calculate they will not match this pattern that year three and year four cash flows have to be ninety percent of the previous years cash flow. So I hope the concept is okay. So that completes our question number six. Hope the video was useful. Hope you learned new concepts. Hope you understood the concepts that you were not understanding earlier. If you like the video, please share the video with your friends. Please subscribe to the channel and I will see you soon in the next video.